Good evening and welcome to the Women's History Month panel, Finding a Voice, the Vote. I'm Rabinder Singh with the Fairfax County Public Library. This program is being brought to you in collaboration with the League of Women Voters of the Fairfax area. Tonight, our panel will explore American women's journey to the right to vote, the struggles for suffrage after 1920, and the continued importance of the vote to the women's voices today. During our discussions, we will celebrate the women who told and tell our stories. A few housekeeping notes before we begin. Please note that all microphones have been muted for this event. If you have questions, please use the chat function and we will get to them at the end of the program. I will now turn this over to Ms. Amy Leeson, member of the Voter Registration Committee for the Fairfax League of Women Voters. Hi, thank you, Ravinder, and good evening, everyone. Um, we'll start this evening off by introducing our panel members, and if our panel members could please just raise their hands as I introduce you so um, our guests know who you are. Um, we'll begin with Lynn Garvey Hodge. Lynn has served on the Fairfax County uh, Virginia History Commission since 2000, representing the Springfield District. Ms. Garvey Hodge has a real passion for bringing the past to life and will be joining us this evening as Mrs. Robert Walker, uh, one of the local suffragists. And uh, Mrs. Walker will be sharing insights into the suffragist movement of the 1920s. So welcome, Lynn. Um, next on our panel, we have um, Dr. Yvette Richards. Dr. Richards is an associate professor at George Mason University as a, and is a specialist in African American history, women's history, labor studies, and Pan-Africanism. She has published um, a book um, entitled Maida Springer, Pan-Africanist and International Labor Leader, among several other titles. So welcome, Dr. Richards. And last but not least, uh, we have Kelly McFarland joining us. She is the Chief of Staff at the League of Women Voters. During her 20-year tenure at the National Office, she has held various leadership positions in service of the League's mission of empowering voters and defending democracy. Thank you and welcome. So to begin our evening, we will be hearing opening comments from each of our panelists, um, and, uh, and then we will move on into the uh, questions. So we will begin um, with Lynn, um, excuse me, Mrs. Robert Walker. I turn the floor over to you, and um, when you have a minute left in your time, I will raise my hand so that you can see um, and can wrap up your comments. Thank you. Over to you, Mrs. Walker. Good evening. It is such an honor to be here on International Women's Day. Uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you almost as if I'm a ghost from the past. And I think for some of you, my picture might sort of look like that. Uh, we did not have an International Women's Day back in the teens and the 20s of this country. And so I'm, I'm here today to tell you about that experience, how I got involved in the suffragist movement. And um, uh, I'll, I'll just wait a, f a few minutes in, until the questions get asked because I've got some wonderful questions to answer. Uh, but it is an honor to be here. And I'm so very, very happy we have this kind of participation this, this evening. And just remember, votes for women. Votes for women. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Walker. Um, Dr. Richards, would you like to uh, go next, please? Good evening, everyone. Happy International Women's Day. And I'd like to thank um, um, Rabinder Singh and Amy Jones and my fellow panelists. It's an honor to be here with you all. I I'd like to start off by just saying that voting rights has always been linked to citizenship rights. And it's important to know that it's early, um, it, that the early citizenship rights naturalization law of 1790 was open only to free white persons. Uh, so this law, um, this naturalization law was not really completely overturned until 1952. 
Um, so um, with the with the McCarran Act, uh, so all vestiges of that statement of that restriction to free white persons lasted for you know most of our history. It's important to know that and 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 to figure that in with how hard it has been for marginalized people to gain the vote in this country, even though we are a democracy and our ideals say that the franchise is open to all, but that's not the way the country started. Um, there were property qualifications and uh, the last of the property qualifications were overturned in 1856 when the state of North Carolina decided to let all white men um, vote regardless of property. Um, and it's important to note that date of 1856 because at that time, of course, black people were considered property. Um, and um, then we, um, you know, have the Civil War and the fight for um, black citizenship rights at that time. And we have voices like Frederick Douglass speaking out even before the Civil War and Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, speaking to the ideals that this country was founded on, saying you know, that black people should be considered citizens in this country, especially after their sacrifices um, in terms of being enslaved and also fighting for their freedom and fighting for the union. And Francis Harper gave this wonderful speech in 1866, appealing to white women to not be narrow in their um, thinking about the franchise and in their thinking about um, the other impediments to citizenship, such as um, the restriction on travel, the restrictions that blacks face in employment. And she specifically brought up Harriet Tubman, who had fought in the Civil War, who was a scout um, um, and a nurse in the Civil War. And on her way back to New York by train, she was forcefully, forcefully evicted from her seat um, and, and, and dislocated her shoulders and her hands were swollen from fighting the conductor who dislocated her from her seat. And so Harper looks at her and says, look, she doesn't have rights in this country. And she, she did a great service for the union in the Civil War. So, um, you know, the, the struggle for women's rights is also the struggle for um, universal rights when it comes to um, the participation of Black women in the movement, because they are not restrictive. They um, are um, uh, fighting for everyone's rights. And when they win, everybody wins. And that was the message of Frances Harper. Thank you. Thank you. Those are great words. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and then Kelly, um, would you care to uh, give us your opening? Yeah, thanks so much. Hello, everyone. I am honored to be with all of you uh, in honor of Women's History Month and certainly International Women's Day. Thanks to the League of the Fairfax Area and the Public Libraries for hosting this and for my fellow panelists for being here tonight. Before I offer a few remarks, I thought it was important that I could uh, share a little bit about the League of Women Voters, who we are. Um, some of you may know the League from having seen our members, many of whom are with us tonight. It's great to see those friendly faces. Uh, for registering voters and supporting candidate debates in Fairfax County or wherever you're joining us from this evening. We are a grassroots organization uh, dedicated to empowering voters to fully participate in our democracy. We are nonpartisan, meaning that we don't support or oppose candidates or political parties. We have members in all 50 states, the district, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. And we don't just empower voters. We advocate and defend policies that support a strong and equitable voting system. We are over 100 years old. Uh, the League was founded in 1920, just six months before the 19th Amendment was ratified and women won the right to vote. Um, we were formed um, by the suffragists of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. Um, and the League began, began its journey as a mighty political experiment. It was designed to help 20 million women carry out their new responsibilities as voters. 
So I need to just take a quick pause here and note that the league's origin story does include exclusion. Back then, the league was not welcoming to women of color, and we have done important work throughout our entire history, but that work hasn't always benefited everyone. Um, there were many times we neglected opportunities to include more voices in our work and who we represented. To say that the League has had a much needed makeover in the last decade is an understatement. The League has expanded our vision of a more inclusive democracy where all Americans, regardless of gender, sex, race, ability, or party, can see themselves represented in our government. We know we have more work to do, um, but we have taken steps to embrace diversity, equity, and inclusion as values throughout the work that we do at the League. Um, and as an organization, as I said, we've just celebrated our 103rd birthday, and we know that democracy is never guaranteed, and we will never stop fighting until everyone, including women, are equally represented in our democracy. So as we've uh, just started to unpack this a little bit, we know that women have always been at the forefront of progress in our country. And it's hard to imagine a time when women didn't have the right to vote, but as we're already starting to, to talk about, it wasn't that long ago. Um, so decades after tireless advocacy protests, uh, women finally won the right to vote um, in 1920. With that right to vote, women have created change through the decades. We have stood up, we have marched, uh, we have mobilized to make our country a better place for all and for future generations. We've used our voices to fight for issues that impact our futures, our communities, and our families. And today our country is stronger because of the incredible strength and the resilience of women. We've come a long way, but in the current day, we see that there is still much work to be done. Um, the sad truth is that today, in 2023, we as women have fewer rights than women have had in decades. Uh, for more than 100 years since women won the right to vote, but we are far from equal in our democracy. Women face unique challenges inside and out of the polling place in order to cast their ballots, especially uh, women of color who are too often the target of voter suppression. Despite the great effort here in Virginia by ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment very recently, uh, it has yet to be added to our Constitution to enshrine equal rights of the sexes into law. And we are too familiar with what has happened to reproductive freedoms for women and those who can become pregnant in the aftermath of, this, aftermath of the Supreme Court's decision to reverse Roe v. Wade. So Women's History Month, uh, which started out as just a week believe it or not, was created by Jimmy Carter in 1980. And he wrote in part in his proclamation, too often the women were unsung and sometimes their contributions were unnoticed. But the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who built America was as vital as that of the men whose names we all know so well. So, uh, as we kick off this discussion here tonight, which I'm really excited for, we know that American women continue to be vital in advancing our democracy. This is a time for us uh, and our allies, us as women and our allies, uh, to come together to make our voices heard through our votes, through participating in local government, through joining the League of Women Voters. Uh, our collective power is undeniable. And our democracy and future generations require us to speak out because women hold the power to create a more perfect democracy. Thank you, Kelly. Um, we will now move um, to hear um, the voice and the contributions to, uh, to um, forming women's um, participation in our democracy um, from Mrs. Walker. Mrs. Walker, um, could you please set the scene for us in 1920? Who were the women who were involved in the suffrage movement? Thank you so much for the question, Amy. Uh, you know, it wasn't just us. And so I wanna go back a little bit, uh, Amy, and, and position sort of where women were in this whole history of this, of this great land. Uh, back in 1776, Abigail Adams said to her husband before he headed off to the Continental Congress, and he was part of the authoring of the doctrine of this, this wonderful land. She said to him, John, John, remember the ladies, remember the ladies. 
And unfortunately, we know what the result of that Continental Congress was. The only pronoun that was used in all that paperwork was the male pronoun. Had that been different, none of us would be sitting here in this kind of dialogue today. So we can say a lot of our hard work was churned in the beginning by Abigail uh, back in 1776. And some other key women through history would include the Grimke sisters of the early 19th century, Sarah and Angelina, who had the temerity to stand up to their slaveholding father, a third generation slaveholding father from South Carolina, and say, that's enough. We cannot be treating other humans like this. And you can imagine the kind of reaction they got in Charleston, South Carolina, even when they tried to go to the church and say, why, why are we worshiping on Sunday to be kind and love one another? When in fact, preachers go home and take great pride in how they've whipped their slaves that day. So there was a lot of work to be done. And Sarah and Angelina spoke out beautifully against it. Uh, and then some years, not too long after their uh, great presence in this, in this land, came 1848 in Seneca Falls, when folks like Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Lucretia Mott got together to form the first, Amer uh, the first American Women's Convention. And uh, it was well attended. About a third of the people there were women. There was only one African-American person there, and that was Frederick Douglass. And I do want to come back and talk about him in a little bit because he was a grand champion for women's suffrage. Um, not long after that, Susan B. Anthony traveled the country enormously, crossing paths with uh, Frederick Douglass along the way, both of them calling for freedom for everybody in this country. By the time 1915 rolled around, there were 12 states west of the Mississippi that had the right to vote for women, 12 states, and they were Washington, Oregon, um, California, Arizona, Utah, Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, uh, Kansas, Illinois, Nevada, and yet none of these states that had the right to vote were east of the Mississippi, which is where most of America's population was at that time. Another grand irony for that time in 1915 was the fact that over 12 countries around the world had votes for women rights, uh, including Denmark, Russia, Finland, Norway, Ireland, Sweden, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, Scotland, and Wales. So there were a lot of other places on this planet where women did have a sense of freedom. This was not a new concept. Uh, the Civil War came and went. Women were um, needing to stay home and take care of what they needed to take care of during that awful, awful scourge upon this land. And at the end of the Civil War, things began to, to cook back up again. We turned into the teens, and a lot of us realized that we did not have much freedom in this, in this land. So we took to picketing. We took to being in parades. Uh, I had the uh, pleasure of participating in the 1913 parade down Pennsylvania Avenue the day that President Wilson came into the White House. Uh, but all the people that would have greeted him at Union Station instead were down in Pennsylvania Avenue cheering us on. So that was an interesting, interesting turnabout. We thought we would have had his support at that time, and yet we did not. Uh, it took until 1917 for women to finally decide that what we needed to do was, in fact, picket in front of the White House. And then I had the opportunity to picket and do um, uh, my time also at the Occoquan Workhouse. Um, and so what did the vote mean to these people? It meant freedom, it meant being able to take care of a family, it meant being able to take care of a child uh, because women did not have property rights. They did not have the right to be able to, to divorce. And the other reality of this time and part of the, 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 the end of the 19th century was the horrific reality of a um, almost an epidemic of syphilis in this land that if men had the disease, there was a belief that if they bedded a virgin, they would be cured. And with that, all kinds of difficult and, and terrible things happened. Lots of unmarried women with, with babies. And so that was another reason we wanted to get the right to vote, to protect these women, to be able to set up laws to protect women's bodies, for them to be able to say no and have men hear that um, effectively. 
So a time went on, we, we obviously were able to get the 19th Amendment passed in, in, in 1920. It meant a great deal to us, but as you've already heard from one of our other panelists who so eloquently spoke about the women that really did not have the right to vote, uh, even in that march down Pennsylvania Avenue on the 3rd of March in 1913, Alice Paul, in not her finest hour, asked the woman of the Delta Sigma Theta sorority from Howard University to march at the back of that parade. So there were some significant differences in this land that, that I hope someday are really, really um, straightened out. Mrs. Locker, thank you for um, that wonderful overview of the women who participated in our early suffragist movement um, and what they that movement meant to them. Um, for your last question, um, could you please um, tell us a little bit about um, if the suffragists could speak to us today, what do you think their message would be? Well, first thing I do want to, to mention, Lisa, is that as along the journey, uh, many of us suffragists in 1917 were taken to the Occoquan Workhouse and brutally treated. Uh, it is my understanding there's a beautiful museum there now that honors those women. Uh, I was one of them. I was taken there on the 14th of, of July in, in 1917. So I got to see firsthand how horrifically terrible uh, women could be treated by men who should have treated us with a great deal of, of dignity. What I would like to believe that the suffragists would, would want to say to us today is please make sure, and I, I think they would be rather surprised that yet we're still fighting for the right to vote in so many parts of this country. I think they would be shocked to know that people could get in trouble for giving somebody water while they were standing in line waiting to vote. Why, when we stood in front of the White House and picketed, in uh, 1917, people did bring us water. They brought us food. Uh, they, they, they cheered us on. Not everyone did, but we ended up with quite a supportive uh, citizenry. Not all Americans were supportive of women getting the right to vote. But I do think today that, that women would go back to some of the great words that we learned from Frederick Douglass, who really was a wonderful cheerleader for us, because Frederick told us to agitate, agitate, agitate. And the only way we can get things done in a land that has some level of stubbornness and hatred in it is to agitate, to stand together, to make sure that we can all look out for each other and so that we can have the kind of peace and understanding that as a Quaker and knowing my Bible, knowing out of the Gospel of John, that we've been commanded to love one another. Thank you, Mrs. Walker. I appreciate you sharing um, your message with us and, and your time this evening. And um, I, I'm glad that you're here joining us and, and not in the workhouse. So thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, we're going to um, pivot now to our, our second panelist, Dr. Yvette Richards, um, who is going to um, answer some questions for us about that important period after 1920 when um, so many um, women continued to struggle to take advantage of the recent rights that we acquired under the 19th Amendment, that right to vote. Um, so Dr. Richards, I'll go ahead and start off with this question. Um, many believe that women um, received the vote in 1920, and that was the end of the issue. But really, the struggle for the vote continued for decades for many women, um, especially in Black and Indigenous populations. Um, can you give us a sense of those unique challenges? Yes, yeah, sure. Thanks for the question. Well, um, Indigenous and Black um, people were disenfranchised in very similar ways through poll taxes, literacy tests, um, through fraud and intimidation. Um, and it's important to note too that um, Indigenous people as a whole did not gain citizenship until 1924. Um, before that, there was the 1887 um, Dawes Act, and that was really an act that was um, um, purported to um, uh, allow Indigenous people to enter into American society, but its aim was to destroy their cultures, to acclimate them to become um, in the image of European American citizens, 
and to take their land. There's a huge land grab that came out of that. Those indigenous people who remained in their um, tribal communities did not get the vote until 1924. And Sitkala Sa was instrumental in that struggle. Um, she formed a couple of um, indigenous rights organizations. She worked out of Washington, DC. Um, and she was a product of the um, American Indian schools. Um, and she fought against them after her experience there, um, the experience of um, the cultures being, uh, try, try, uh, the, the schools trying to obliterate their culture. She actually taught with under at the Carlisle School and quit um, under Richard Henry Pratt, whose motto was, you know, kill the Indian to save the man. So um, we owe her a lot for expanding the rights of um, indigenous people to vote, um, but um, states still had a say so over what the qualifications were to vote. They still do. That's why we have this, you know, um, this this lack of equal access across the country. And it wasn't until um, finally in 1964, Maine allowed unrestricted franchise for indigenous people that the last state dropped restrictions. Um, as far as um, African American women, they face the same restrictions in the South that African-American men faced. And most black people at that time were still in the South. The great migration was beginning to happen and it would speed up and would be in full force in the 1940s. And the fact that a lot of black people moved to the North meant that they could vote and they could influence dem um, policies in the North. They could influence Franklin Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt. And, and um, their influence in the Democratic Party in the North um, um, helped to change um, the nation's outlook on civil rights. Um, there were still huge struggles. The Democratic Party of the South was still the party of white supremacy. And that party um, fought hard against, um, uh, you know, there were some called so-called racist progressives in the South, like Vardaman, who um, wanted white women to vote, but not black women to vote. And then there were many other politicians who said um, the women's vote cannot be because that means that black women will vote and it will be harder to disenfranchise them than it was to disenfranchise black men because you can't kill them as easily you know, <laughs> and get away with it. There was a lot of murder and violence against black men um, in, um, before they were formally disenfranchised in in many state constitutions in the South. But throughout this period, Black people are trying to register and vote. It's not until the passage of the 1965 um, Voting Rights Act, which is now under attack since the Shelby decision, that Black people en masse were um, able to register to vote in the South. But there were many people um, from Mary McLeod Bethune, Ida B. Wells, um, um, uh, Rosa Parks in her early years, Septima Clark, Ella Baker, who were on the forefront of fighting for um, the rights of Black people to vote, which meant that all Black people could vote. Thank you. Um, you mentioned several um, important um, Black women in, in your final comments there, and I was wondering if you could um, potentially expand on that a little bit. Um, you know, Black women, they have played a significant role in moving forward the right to vote, um, despite the fact that their voices were often not heard or actively suppressed. Um, what are some ways that they overcame these additional barriers, and what can be learned from them? I think the way they overcame them is to not give up and to organize. They were supreme organizers and often didn't get the credit for doing all the organizing. Um, and some of them are remembered, you know, Rosa Parks is now being remembered more for just sitting, you know, on the, uh, not giving up her seat. I mean, it's a tired story about how she was tired. That's not at all true either. But, you know, she was involved with voting rights in the 1940s you know, and had to, to um, fight, um, uh, had to, to try to, she tried to register three times before she was able to, 
to register to vote. The same with Fannie Lou Hamer. So they, they organize, they belong to NAACP chapters, they belong to um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, they belong to churches, they form their own clubs, like the National Association of Colored Women, which was formed in 1896. And it fought for women's rights, it also fought against lynching, and it fought for the basic respect of Black women. At that time, even you know, white um, uh, um, tolerance for lynching was blamed on um, uh, uh, was was blamed on this idea that black women didn't know how to raise black men, and not the fact that lynching is just a tool of race hatred, right? Um, so black women were 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 criticized and demonized. Um, throughout the country. So they had to form their own organizations to uplift their voices and to defend themselves. Thank you. Um, I have another question here. Many marginalized members of our society continue to face challenges when trying to vote, whether it's voting IDs, polling times, access to polling locations. What is the most important thing, in your opinion, that can be done to improve this situation, and why? Uh, that's a, there are just so many things wrong. It's hard to <laughs> pick one. But gerrymandering is a huge problem. Right. You know, it dilutes the voting strength of of, um, of people um, who are marginalized. Um, in North Carolina, you know, they gerrymandered it so much that it is practically impossible to elect more than two Democrats, you know, um, to Congress. Um, and they're doing this in other areas too in Texas. And so they are using race as a way to dilute the strength of black voters and so that they cannot be represented properly. Their issues cannot be represented properly in Congress. Another huge issue is closing voting places and long lines. You only hear of long lines in urban areas, right, where there are majority Black populations. You don't hear of long lines in rural areas. Um, so this is purposeful, you know, to close voting places, to not al allow, to only allow one drop box. That's what Texas is doing in, in each county when there are some counties that are so dense and then there are other counties that aren't. And to just allow one drop box is, is a way of suppressing the vote. Um, voter IDs too, you know, disproportionately people of color, black people don't have the proper um, uh, um, government papers to get a photo ID, um, especially if they move from one state to the other. You know, they may vote okay in, in one state, but if they move to another state and have to re-register and they don't have the proper documents, it can be, that's a poll tax. And we've heard of cases like that. And it's so interesting. I do a lot of genealogy work with my current research and I've also done it in my family. And my father does not have the same name um, on his original, I don't even know if he had a birth certificate, but the name that, that he had at first was the name that some nurse gave him in the hospital. And my grandmother said, I didn't name him that, <laughs> you know? So my goodness. <laughs> the service, he had a new name. I mean, he had his own name and that became his official name. Um, with my mother too, she has a different um, uh, last name than what's on her birth certificate, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> she rolled with it. And, but, you know, these are the kinds of things that can trip people up who are U.S. citizens. You know, there are mistakes that are made as well. And um, Black people's voices were not often heard in those, uh, you know, when they were talking to um, the people who were filling out the forms or they were filled out incorrectly or there's a, a misspelling. So, you know, um, and then just getting these government documents is it, you know, incurs a cost. So, um, you know, there are just so many things where I'm shortening the hours to vote. Um, when people are struggling, they're working hard, um, they have jobs, um, they have childcare, they have to pick up their children, they have to cook dinner. To restrict the hours of voting means that you are restricting the chances of them participating in the process. 
Thank you. That was a great summary of the numerous challenges that we're facing you know, as a country to expand um, voting rights and be more inclusive, things that we need to look at and address. Right. Um, I have one final question for you. Um, and this is just a little bit of a kind of a pivot um, from mm -hmm. what we've talked about. I was hoping that you might be able to tell us a little bit about the role of working women, um, since I know that some of your, your studies focus on, on the labor movement. Um, but what role did working women play in the continued struggle for suffrage in the 1920s or, or you know, even into today? You choose your, choose your time. Um, and how did that role um, differ from um, maybe their earlier participation? Yes, um, that's a great question. There, you know, um, you know, the women's suffrage movement is largely known as a white middle class movement in the early part of the century. But there were, you know, um, working women always involved, some who were with labor unions like Rose Snyderman or Clara Limlick, but there were others who weren't and who were just, you know, they were working and they were women and they wanted the right to vote. And I, I think I'd like to highlight one woman um, who came to my attention as I was writing my book on Maida Springer. She um, called me up and she said, you know, I can't believe I, I forgot to talk about this woman. I must talk about her and her work. And her name was Aura Lee Malone. And she was born in Alabama or born in Mississippi, but raised mainly in Alabama. Um, she was born in 1918. And she was a fierce organizer. She was a fierce proponent for labor, for women's rights, and for low-wage workers. And, um, you know, one of her earliest experiences was, um, was uh, you know, fighting for voting rights in Alabama. And she was fearless in this at a time when it was very dangerous. She actually saw an elderly Black man shot in the back for trying to register to vote. But that did not stop her. She was not afraid. And she had a way of, of organizing other people to not be afraid either. Um, she had terrific charisma. Um, and she, she fought all of her life. Even after retirement, she was still fighting. She was part of the anti-apartheid struggle. She was one of the founders of the Coalition of Labor Union Women. She was one of the founders and leaders of the Black Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and also the A. Philip Randolph Institute, the local. She was a leader in St. Louis of that local there, which um, dedicated itself to voting rights um, in the name of A. Philip Randolph. Um, and, you know, uh, when she was sick in the hospital, they asked her, you know, um, uh, you know, what her advice was. And she said, this is in 2012, she says, keep the voting rights alive and keep fighting for justice, you know. And this is, you know, a, just amazing that, you know, when she's dying, she's still thinking about the struggle. And probably at a time when a lot of people were kind of complacent and thinking, oh, you know, the Voting Rights Act is secure, but she did not believe that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, she was... She came out of the um, Amalgamated Clothing Workers Association, and she was the first Black international business representative for that organization. But everyone who came into contact with her talked about how she was such a galvanizing force, yet, um, you know, we barely know about her. And so I'd like to uplift her name, Aura Lee Malone out of St. Louis, Missouri. Thank you very much. And thank you for highlighting um, someone who is, who has kind of faded from um, the, from history. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, we are going to move forward several decades now, and um, we're going to talk with um, Kelly McFarland, um, who again works for the National League. Um, and Kelly is going to focus her question. The questions we'll be asking Kelly will be focused on kind of. Um, you know, current voting efforts, um, what, what's happening, um, and, and some of the work that the league is currently doing. 
Um, so Kelly, I'm going to um, start off um, by asking you uh, why suffrage and voting rights are still important for women. Yeah, well, um, gosh, these inspiring stories about these tenacious women from uh, our past. Um, there are still lots of tenacious women out there today uh, in this fight. Um, as we have heard from our panelists, voting rights are not guaranteed, right? And the right to vote has to be protected and in some cases has to be restored um, even today. I know we already mentioned uh, the important Supreme Court decision from 2013, Shelby v. Holder, which really gutted the Voting Rights Act, right? Um, and since then, we have seen a rise in voter suppression in this past decade. Um, we touched on some of these things already, more restrictive voter ID bills, um, unlawful purges of the voting rolls, fewer polling places for people to get to, um, cutting back the hours or even the process for early voting, um, and then even restricting groups like the League, a nonpartisan organization, from being able to help people to register to vote, to even enter into the process. Um, just to give you all a sense, um, there was a report that came out um, uh, in the first two months of this year, of 2023, that state legislatures across the country have introduced 150 bills that would restrict voting rights. So... We know that women and allies fought so hard, as we've said here, to win the right to participate in elections, and we need to honor those who came before us and participate in democracy. Women actually participate at a much higher uh, rate than men. So since 1980, more women have registered and voted uh, in elections than men have. Um, women make up the majority of the poll workers and the important volunteers um, who serve as election administrators, right? Um, and they support the polling places on election day. Um, at the same time, as we've just been talking about, the women are disproportionately affected by things like voter ID. Um, you know, part of that is because um, many of us, when we marry, change our names, um, and so there was a study, um, it's, it's a good decade old or so now, but it said at 48% of um, voting age women hold a birth certificate that doesn't reflect the name that they're using now, their current name. Um, and so because of marital status and so forth, um, it disproportionately affects women as well as uh, where Dr. Richards already pointed out, women of color uh, and so forth. So, um, you know, we hold a, a lot of power as a voting bloc, um, but we have to turn out and we have to use our voices. We have to make our voices heard um, in order to, to leverage that power. Thank you. Um, the women's suffrage movement before and in the decades after the passage of the 19th Amendment was marked by racism and a lack of inclusion of women of color, a sad legacy um, in which the League of Women Voters uh, shares. And you touched on that uh, briefly in your opening comments. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more on that and talk us specifically about what, what the League has done to improve their record in recent years. Yeah, so uh, as you said, I, I touched on it a little bit in my you know, opening remarks. I think it's it's really important that we, incredibly important, we have to tell um, the whole story of our history, right? Um, and that includes impact and harm. Um, and throughout our history, as I noted, the League has not always been welcoming to women of color. Um, and, you know, we need to recognize and acknowledge our flaws in our humanity um, and those of our foremothers. Um, over the last decade, you know, the League has um, really done a deep dive into our culture um, in an effort to be more inclusive. Um, we've made changes to systems, to policies, and to our practices um, to ensure that we are really holding um, a, a diversity, equity, and inclusion at the forefront, holding that lens in front of all the work that we are doing. I think one of the biggest ways um, that folks can see that is that the organizations that we partner with, um, we strive to always be a strong ally and a strong partner to Black women, to people of color, and acknowledging the fact that um, those individuals face more barriers at the ballot box. We know that power is grown together, um, and we also know that there are times where we can be leaders, but there are times when we can step back and really be a strong and important ally to others in this fight. So I know it's an ongoing journey for us as individuals and certainly for us as an organization, 
um, but we are committed to this work as we move forward. Thank you, Kelly. Um, I think um, it would be interesting if you could uh, talk a little bit about what the league is doing to encourage new voters and, um, and to engage with our um, underserved communities. Yeah, so um, at the national level, the league, as I mentioned, you know, earlier is always advocating and litigating to um, expand voter access to ensure voter access. In the last election cycle alone, we were involved in over 70 lawsuits to pr protect voters. Um, we are also deeply committed to seeing the Equal Rights Amendment uh, become part of the Constitution and guarantee those same uh, freedoms for, for all women. And in fact, um, the League submitted a testimony last week at the congressional hearing. Across the country, though, at the, at the local and the state level, the Leagues are involved in such important voter registration work, um, serving first-time young voters, new citizens, um, as well as formerly and currently incarcerated voters. Um, I know the Fairfax Area League, um, and I've had the privilege to be part of some of these efforts um, is highly engaged in registering high school students as well as new citizens at naturalization ceremonies, um, from those that are at government offices to sometimes those special events in the community, like I know they did Liberty Month in Vienna, and I think most recently uh, some folks were at Mount Vernon uh, welcoming new citizens as they start in that journey. Thank you. Um, I guess um, for your last question, um, how can women become more informed voters? Yeah, so first and foremost, I just I want to say it's so important for all of us to vote in every election. <laughs> there are not elections yeah. <laughs> every two years, every four years. There are elections every year. And this year in Virginia, we have a lot of elections, right? Um, and so um, I would encourage folks to visit the League Runs, a nonpartisan election uh, information website. It's called vote411.org. Um, you can enter your address. You can see what the upcoming election is in your area. You can find um, out about whether there's early voting, um, any identification you might need, um, research candidates, what questions are on the ballot and even find as simple as your polling place. Um, that's often the number one question that, that folks get is where do I actually go to vote? Um, and it can change depending you know, on the election. So um, on a separate note, I'd say there are other ways to get engaged too. Um, I serve as a poll worker. Um, as I noted earlier, uh, there are many women who do that. It's an incredibly important job. Um, I would encourage folks between elections to attend local government meetings, really understand the issues that are before your community, and possibly even think about running for office yourself. Or if you don't want to go through an election, uh, join a border commission. There are many ways um, that they, many places within the county where they are looking for uh, citizens to get engaged and be involved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rabinder, do we have questions from the audience? Not really. There are lots of comments um, and people okay. have been having a conversation along the way. Uh, and if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to take it up. Okay, great. Well, we're waiting to see if anybody has any questions they would like to ask our panelists. I'm going to go ahead and ask our panelists to do a really quick round table as sort of a last hurrah. Um, and each, I would like to ask each of you to share um, a woman from history or your, or your life who tells your story. Um, so since this is a quick round table, everyone will have about um, a minute um, to go ahead and answer. So we will do reverse order this time and we will go ahead and start with uh, Kelly. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to, Amy, I'm sorry, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to break the rules right off and say okay. two, two people, uh, but um, I, I, I'm picking from my life and I'm going to say my two daughters, I have two teenage daughters, and um, I don't know how much they tell my story, um, but certainly I want them to be able to tell their own stories and be able to write their own stories. I want them to be able to use their voice in all its forms 
And, you know, that's what gets me out of bed in the morning. That's why I vote. That's why I fight for democracy. That's why I do the work that I do. So my two daughters. Thank you, Kelly. Um, Dr. Richards. Well, since Kelly broke the rules, I'll break them too. <laughs> why not? Let's all just break all the rules. <laughs> <laughs> it's her fault. Right. <laughs> well blame <done>, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> so I I I think I would like to highlight Georgia Gilmore, who started this organization called the Club to Nowhere. And it was a way to um, disguise who they were and also to do the work of raising money for the Montgomery Improvement Association during the bus boycott. And so she was an activist. She's working class. She is a cafeteria worker who was fired from her job. She spoke back. She didn't care, you know. And actually, they also sold food to um, white people downtown <laughs> to help to finance the civil rights movement. And she got into friendly competition with another group of Black women in Montgomery to see who could raise the most money by cooking and, and selling their, their food, their meals, and then bringing it to support the civil rights movement in Montgomery. And in the beginning, that's where the money came from. And they raised a lot of money. And, um, and she was someone who was behind the scenes, who Martin Luther King would come to her house and eat. You know, she was a great cook. And um, so, you know, she's someone who we should lift up and remember to Georgia Gilmore. Another person I'd like to speak on is Septima Clark, or it may have been Septima. I'm not sure how she pronounced her name after all this time, but she was from South Carolina, from Charleston. Um, and she worked with, um, uh, she knew Judge um, Julius Waitis Waring, who, um, who, um, was transformed by divorcing his Southern Belle wife and marrying a Northerner. <laughs> that was part of the way he was transformed. <laughs> no one ever divorced, you know, white people didn't, of, of, of that status didn't divorce back then. Um, and, but he transformed himself on the court and he was a fighter for civil rights. And it's his dissent um, in a case called uh, um, Board of Education Against Claire. Um, against a uh, case against Clarendon County in South Carolina, um, where blacks were discriminated against in the education system. It was his dissent at the district level on his three judge panel that served as a basis for Brown v. Board of Education. And so um, Septima Clark was brave enough to hang out with him when everybody was, you know, a lot of black people were afraid because he was targeted by white supremacists who saw him as a traitor. Um, and she, um, uh, you know, was, was galvanized by his courage as well. And she's like, I'm going to support him. And she became um, a leader of the citizenship school movement. And that formed the basis. That was really the groundwork for transforming voting rights in this country. Um, she trained other people. Um, to become um, advocates for voting rights and to teach people how to overcome the impediments to voting that were out there, the literacy test, um, et cetera, um, pay the poll tax. Uh, so she was a revolutionary um, during the civil rights movement and did a lot of work behind the scenes through Highlander School, if you've heard of Highlander Folk School um, in Tennessee, that's where she first got started and worked with Andy Young later on when the police shut down Highlander <laughs> because it was doing good work, right? Uh, so um, I, I uplift both of those people tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Mrs. Walker, we will end with you. All right. Uh, thank you. You've been a wonderful audience. I've really enjoyed all the, the information that's come through here. In fact, a, um, a person just, I can't see who it was, talked about Dora Stevens' book, Jailed for Freedom. Um, so let me kind of do a little bit more history here. I am wearing a Jailed for Freedom pin. 
This was uh, a pin that was given to the almost 100 women at the end of 1917 at the Belasco Theater in Washington, D.C. for having survived their time at the Occoquan Workhouse. So um, I did want to make sure to mention that. I also wanted to mention, I saw it in the chat, that uh, the, the Turning Point Suffragist Memorial, which is near and dear to my heart, this is more current history. I want to do a shout out to a couple of people. Kathleen Pablo, who I know is here tonight, um, I know that Pat Worth is, is a very, very dear and treasured friend of mine, um, Edie Mayo, um, Julie Martin Magus, uh, all, all kinds of women helped make that memorial happen. And I highly encourage all of you on a beautiful day to drive down to Occoquan Regional Park and tour that. And you'll get to see a statue of Ida B. Wells and Katie Chapman. Uh, Kat and um, Alice Paul, of course, it's quite a testimony to the women that fought then for the right to vote, but we can't also uh, forget it. In terms of <clears throat> people, I'd like to sit, well, first of all, I'd love to have lunch with Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. I just think we talk for days. Um, but <clears throat> another person way far back in history, some of you may have heard of her, as a woman from Germany named Hildegard of Bingen. She was very big on women's rights and protecting women. She was very big on reproductive protection, very big on, uh, she was a wonderful artist. She was a wonderful musician. She was often sought after by other key um, country statesmen, uh, almost like an executive coach, which is is, is one of the practices that, that, that Lynn Garvey Hodges has in her life. And I think she had, she had seen so much at that time. I would love to hear what her vision was um, from that, that, that she was a medieval, um, woman that ran a nunnery. And I'd love to know what her vision was for women on into the future, because we definitely are strong. We are, all women are strong. Feminists know that. We just have to make sure the rest of the world gets it too. Thank you. Great, great, um, words to end on here. Um, I would like to thank our panelists. You all have been wonderful. Thank you for sharing um, so much of your knowledge and as well as your personal stories with us this evening. Um, and um, also to our audience, thank you. Um, I am gonna make one uh, shameful plug um, for our Continued Women's History Month events. Um, this um, event is going to take place on Saturday, 11 March. Um, if you have a child uh, between the ages of 9 and 12, please consider attending our co-hosted art project with um, Fairfax County Public Library System. The theme is Create Women's Stories in Silhouette um, and will be taught by the local artist Marami Andriozzi. Um, again, the class is scheduled for Saturday, 11 March from 1 to 3. Um, and additional um, details can be found under library events um, on the Fairfax County Public Library website. So once again, thank you. Thank you so much, Mrs. Walker, Dr. Richards, and Kelly McFarland. Thank you um, so much for all of your time this evening. And um, Rabinder, over to you if you have any, any closing comments. Uh, thank you, Amy. First of all, thank you, panelists. But before I let you go, uh, I'd like to squeeze in one question, if I may, because we've had a few who roll in. Would someone speak about the Equal Rights Amendment? Yeah, Alice Paul wrote that right after we got the right to vote. And we are still fighting to get it today. It is passed in Virginia. We need 36 states before it uh, becomes official. We are Sadly, after all these years, over a hundred years later, we are still having a hard time getting that very simple equal rights amendment passed. So please, you. you get a chance to vote for it, vote for it, wherever you may be living. And just tied to your, again, another question about force feeding at the, of these hunger strikers at the Lawton prison, if you could say a few yeah, words. I, I that. saw that. I saw that in the chat box, Rabina. Um, it, it was really a horrific way to, to treat the suffragists. We were called suffragists, not suffragettes. It was Alice Paul and Lucy Burns decided to have our name be more ladylike than the suffragettes of Britain. Uh, but that forced feeding was a practice also in Britain. And a, a tube would go down the suffragist who uh, was deemed uh, 
uh, out, out of control, if you will, by, by the, the prison wardens. And they were force fed because they had decided to go on a, on a hunger strike to make a statement, uh, a mixture of raw egg yolk and flour. And that was forced down into their uh, digestive uh, tract. As a very bloody, messy, uh, awful reality. It is one of the embarrassments, I think, of something that's happened here in, in Fairfax County in terms of how treat, women have been mis, mistreated. I do want to add that the warden at the uh, Occoquan Workhouse, where the women were taken that had picketed um, in front of the White House in 1917, uh, he had done some wonderful things in his ideas for creating the Lorton Reformatory, Fresh Air and Rehab Rehabilitation. Don't know what happened by the time he got to the suffragist women. He was very, very mean-spirited. And the last I've heard, I don't know if anybody else in the audience knows more about this, kind of after the 19th Amendment passed, he just seemed to disappear from the stage. So we're not really sure what happened to him. Thank you. Well, I'd like to say my thanks to Amy Leeson for bringing us all together. And wonderful panelists, wonderful evening. Uh, lots to think about and take action off on. You know. So thank you once again. Thank you for, to the audience for being here tonight and have a good night, everyone. Yes. Rabinder, thank you to, the, uh, to you and also to the Fairfax County Public Library for uh, co-sponsoring this event. Oh yeah, uh, we could not have done it without you. We appreciate your partnership. Thank you. Thank you.